I'm Martin Tyler, and you're listening to Harry Simeon. Hey everybody, how's it going? Welcome back along to the Chronicles of Aguna, the Arsenal podcast, part of the 90 Min Football Network. As ever, I'm your host, Harry Simiu. And on today's edition of the show, we're going to be talking Aaron Ramsdale after reports have emerged with regards to his new and improved long-term contract at Arsenal, which we believe is uh, close to being signed. Good news on that front. Arsenal have been really, really proactive, it seems, uh, over the last sort of 12 months or so to keep improving the deals that our players on, even if it doesn't feel like a really urgent thing to do, given how long they have remaining on their contracts. You know, the club have an opportunity to save some money by potentially not bolstering up these people's wages um, earlier than they technically need to. But I think Arsenal have learned from the lessons of the past. And Arsenal now recognise that if you want to stay at the top, if you want to compete at the top, you have to be competitive in terms of what you pay people, in terms of how proactive you are. When it comes to extending deals, you have to make the moves uh, at the right time. You can't afford to get into situations that we used to find ourselves in regularly where we had key players, really, really important players who would get to the end of their contracts, would feel unwanted because it had taken Arsenal an absolute age to get to this point, then would demand big terms, big wages, big salaries, long-term deals that Arsenal weren't prepared to, to sort of honour or to meet. And we'd end up losing those players. And that was a big problem for us. And there were so many big names over that period of time when we just moved to Emirates Stadium that we lost as a result of not being proactive enough when it came to contract negotiations. So here we are now trying to be proactive. Here we are now trying to do the right things by our players. Gabriel Martinelli uh, recently signed. We think that Bukayo Saka's deal is imminent as well in terms of its announcement. And Aaron Ramsdale is the latest to add to that list. We're still waiting for an update on William Saliba as well. But, you know, these are feel-good stories. These are the type of stories that as a fan of a football club, you want to be hearing and you want to be hearing um, on a regular basis, you know, making sure that you are securing your talent down and that you are showing ambition as a football club. Because remember how many players, again, in the past, I refer to the past, I know things have changed, but how many players would say, Arsenal aren't matching my ambition. And now matching ambition and, and showing that you want to move forward as a football club isn't just about what you go and do in the transfer market and the players that you bring in externally. It's about making sure that you make it clear that you want to hold down and tie down the people that have done really well for you and the people that have ultimately got you back into contention. Uh, Aaron Ramsdale certainly fits that bill. And, and the report uh, that we are seeing, we've seen a number of reports uh, talking about this over the last few days um, and uh, it's picking up more and more traction, this story. Uh, so James Olley of ESPN uh, says Aaron Ramsdale was close to agreeing a new long term contract with the Arsenal. I love it when people refer to us as the Arsenal. Um, sources have told ESPN a formal announcement over Ramsdale's deal is expected soon. So if a formal announcement is imminent or is expected in the near future, that suggests to me that this is done. Now, from what I understand, Aaron Ramsdale was on a roundabout £60,000 per week, um, which is obviously a hell of a lot of money. But by Premier League standards, you know, you're talking about a team right now that are competing right at the top and and you hope and you would think would continue to compete around about that level. We're going to be back in the Champions League next season as well. Um, you would think that, you know, there's going to come a point where we not need to start paying salaries to people that reflect that. Aaron Ramsdale is Arsenal's number one. Um, he's head and shoulders above Matt Turner. I'm sorry to say that, but he really, really is. And he's so important to the way that we play. He's so important to the way our game has changed and developed. And his skill set has been the perfect fit. Now, you can see why Mikel Arteta went out and spent 30, 35 million pounds on him. I remember at the time on this podcast, and I'm happy to, to say this and hold my hands up. I remember at the time thinking this was crazy. I remember at the time thinking we needed further enforcements in midfield. Therefore, how could we justify spending 35 million pounds or north of that on a goalkeeper that had been relegated a couple of times. To me, it didn't make sense. But obviously, I didn't see what Mikel Arteta saw and what the recruitment team saw, which is a really, really great shot stopper in Aaron Ramsdale, who unfortunately had played at teams beforehand where he didn't really stand much chance of keeping clean sheets with any regularity. Someone with the, the footballing ability 
with the ball at his feet to be able to help us in our build-up and help us start uh, the game in the way that we want to. Also, somebody with the right mentality to go on and push and succeed and develop. Somebody who'd been very experienced and and at such a young age, somebody who had experienced the real lows of football relegation and perhaps as a consequence of that was even more desperate than most to achieve the highs. And you can tell by his mentality. You can tell by the way he sort of refocuses himself after a mistake. You can tell by how he likes to psych himself up that the mentality thing for Aaron Ramsdale is a big thing and it's something he works on and focuses on. I guess you either have it or you don't, but I think if you go through what Aaron Ramsdale has gone through at such an early stage in his career, you do develop a bit of a resilience. And that for me is is a, a real key factor in why Aaron Ramsdale is so good and why Aaron Ramsdale is a great fit. I mean, as I say, not only does he make world-class saves on a regular basis, you know, he, he plays out from the back really comfortably. He gives the defenders when they're being pressed an option. And if you're going to sort of invite the press in the way that we do sometimes and you're going to want to play around that, you need a goalkeeper who's comfortable with the ball at his feet. You need a goalkeeper who's got the cojones, if you like, to dink it over an oncoming defender, who can spot that line-breaking pass, has the confidence and then the technique to be able to execute that to get you going on a move. Aaron Ramsdale has all of those things. Will he and has he made mistakes along the way? Of course, and he will continue to do so. And I've said this a million and one times on this podcast. As a manager in 2023, if you are adamant that you want your team to play out from the back. If you are dead set on that, you have to accept that in instructing your goalkeeper to do so, there will be times where they make mistakes. Nobody's pass accuracy is 100%. So why should a goalkeeper be that high? And the other thing is that when you do give the ball away as a goalkeeper, the probability of you being punished for that is much higher than, for example, if Gabriel Jesus gave it away up the other end of the pitch. So these are the things that you have to think about. There is an acceptance. There is an understanding there is a, almost a tolerance level for these mistakes. Obviously, you don't want them to come in the big moments and you want to limit them as much as you possibly can. But playing that way comes with its risks. And that shouldn't be something that you look at Aaron Ramsdale for and criticise him for. That's something that the manager has decided. That's something that the team have decided in terms of how they want to play and how they want to move forward. Now, goalkeepers like Aaron Ramsdale, 99% of the time, do it brilliantly from time to time, they will make a mistake. And there is a chance, as I say, because they are the last line of defence, that you will get exposed for that, that you will get punished for that. There are other goalkeepers in the Premier League nowadays, David De Gea, for example, being one of them. He's been in the news a lot recently. He certainly can't play this way. And that will hinder Manchester United under Eric Ten Hag. That will hinder their development into what he actually wants them to be, into what his end game is and what his end goal is for Manchester United. So we are extremely fortunate to have a goalkeeper that can play this way, to have a goalkeeper that can do what goalkeepers traditionally did as well and still need to do very much, which is make good saves, keep you in games. He also has an incredible mentality. And at 24 years old, which is nowhere near the peak of a goalkeeper, you know, he he can only get better, gener- genuinely. He can only get better. He's, his career is on a trajectory that is only headed one way. And and that, for me, um, is is reason to to time down. Also, it goes back to what I was talking about earlier, the need to be competitive when it comes to salaries, when it comes to length of contract. £60,000 a week is a lot of money to me or you, uh, but for a goalkeeper playing for a Premier League title challenger slash Champions League club, that's probably well below the market value. And Arsenal have recognised that they need to do something to, to sort of put that right, to stop Aaron Ramsdale's head turning potentially. You know, it works both ways, doesn't it? The club took a punt on him, took a gamble on him. He's repaid that faith in him. And now they're returning that favour by offering him a contract with much better uh, terms and um, and a contract that will see him at the Arsenal um, for a long, long time. If he does want to go, if Arsenal want to move him on, his value will be protected as a result of that as well. So I'm buzzing about this news and I can't wait for it to be announced. I think a lot of these... Um, contract stories I feel like a lot of them have been resolved I think that a lot of them have already been done agreed Um, I feel like they're ready to go but I think what Arsenal are maybe doing is holding off on the announcements I've talked about this before the timing of these announcements can be key because they can really lift the morale of the fan base if Arsenal were to miss out on the Premier League title then 
you know, there will be an air of disappointment. There will be frustration. People will be upset about that because of how long we led the the charge for and, and the position that we've lost it from essentially. But I think if we got to the summer and then we started hearing about the contract renewals of Ramsdale, of Saka, of Saliba, hopefully, people would go, hold on a minute. We missed out this time, but my God, we're on the right path. And ultimately, you know, that could give the fan base a real boost going into the summer. It can help maintain that momentum that we've built over the course of this season. And that wave can carry us through the summer, hopefully with some good incomings in terms of business as well. And we can go again in an even more buoyant mood, in an even more uh, positive fashion. And, you know, we go again, as they say. Uh, things are going to be a lot more difficult next season with the Champions League. And the demands on these players are going to be greater. I guarantee you that Aaron Ramsdale is going to be playing in the Champions League and Matt Turner isn't, probably. And so the new contract, as I say, is uh, is justified and it's the right thing for Arsenal to do. I'm absolutely buzzing with this news. Um, and uh, fingers crossed we hear this type of uh, this type of report with regards to some of our other players as well whose contracts are running low. OK, elsewhere, uh, Fabrizio Romano has uh, been talking. Um, let me just take that off the screen. There we go. Fabrizio Romano has been talking uh, about Romeo Lavia on a recent podcast. Another player that has been linked with a move to Arsenal recently. I like Romeo Lavia. I do. What I've seen of him has been positive. I think that it's fair that there are a number of clubs circling around him, looking at him with Southampton doomed. And this summer being the summer before Manchester City's buyback clause becomes valid, I think there'll be a lot of clubs thinking, well, this is our chance to go out and get him. And if we don't and we leave it another year, we could end up missing out on him. So, yeah, I think this is um, this is one that makes sense. You know, we want to add in midfield. We want to continue to improve our depth in those areas. My only concern with Ro Romeo Lavia is, is he quite ready? Like, is he ready to come into a side that are wanting to compete for the biggest honours and right at the top end and have that impact? I'm not sure that he is. I feel like this would be not quite a Sambi Lukonga signing because he had no Premier League experience. This guy's got a year under his belt, at least a season under his belt. But it's been a difficult season given Southampton's position. And, you know, he's starring in that team and he's shining in that team partly, not, not to take anything away from him, but partly because they've not been very good. How ready is Romeo Lavia to come in and help us now? And I really do believe that the next phase for Arsenal is not to go out and buy more young talent and more players that we're hopeful will make their mark in the next two, three seasons. It's about going and buying better players than what we already have. So someone who's better than Granit Xhaka, someone who's as good as, if not better than Thomas Partey, someone that can compete with Martin Odegaard, etc. Do you see what I'm trying to say? I don't think he's quite at the level where he's going to help us and take us to that next level today. And, um, you know, will Arsenal decide to do something like this on the basis, I beg your pardon, that it is a, a slightly longer term investment? Maybe, but for me, this wouldn't be a priority. And I know that's going to be an unpopular opinion because I know a lot of people really like Lavia and what he's done. I just think this would fall into the bracket of one for the future. And uh, and right now, I think we're so lacking in certain areas, midfield being one of them, that we're only one or two injuries away from having a real crisis and for the level really dropping. Jorginho has been able to come in and, and plug the Thomas Partey hole as he's gone out of form and that's been fine. But is that sustainable? If Granit Xhaka's out, who'd you put in there? Fabio Vieira, is he good enough right now? I don't think he is. Is there any guarantee that Emil Smith-Rowe will be able to play that position despite reports that he's been training and learning to play there? No guarantees there either. So for me, it's about going out first and foremost and bringing in players that will take us forward. If you've got a bit of extra cash laying about, if you've got a little bit more spending power, then yeah, great. Go out there and, um, and look at players for the future or players that are on the cusp maybe of being ready and develop them and then potentially you can either sell them on for more or they'll become a real key component in your team. Romeo Lavia though for me as much as I admire the player like what I've seen and I'm excited by 
what he could become is not the priority for me this summer and he's nowhere near it. That's just, again, um, my view. Look, we're going to take a very, very short pause. Going to bring you a quick message from our sponsor and then uh, we're going to talk a little bit of Champions League. We'll be in it next season, so we're kind of allowed to now, aren't we? Okay, um, just to remind you guys, this podcast is brought to you by the good people over at NordVPN, which costs just the price of a cup of coffee per month nothing really uh you can do so many amazing things with nordvpn not only uh, does it protect you when you're surfing the web uh protect your data protect you from uh some of the issues that can arise when you're uh, somebody who uses the internet regularly and inputs data on there um nordvpn will give you that added layer of extra protection as well as a number of other benefits. And as I've mentioned, it only costs the price of a cup of coffee per month. NordVPN allows you, on top of that, to change your virtual location, which is a really, really powerful thing on the internet. You might be wondering what that means or what you can do by changing your virtual private location. Uh, So there are a couple of things. First of all, you'll be able to purchase flights from different locations which often can save you a lot of money. Change your location, for example, to the destination uh, to which you're traveling. And you might find that the flights are cheaper from that end. There's so many different possibilities when you can change your location. You'll find different prices, different taxes, different costs. There's so many amazing things uh, that you can do and that you can um, play around with. You can also watch sporting events, TV shows, movies, um, whatever you like, basically, that is un- that are normally unavailable in your region. So for me, sometimes I log on to my Netflix account with um, with uh, my location set to the US and I can access a different inventory of programming. Sometimes I log in for, with the location of Greece or Cyprus and I'm able to watch Greek TV that ordinarily will be geo-blocked. Equally, when I'm abroad and I want to log into my Sky Go to watch Premier League football, if I change my location to the UK, I can do that. If I want to log into the BBC iPlayer to watch Match of the Day, which you can't do from abroad, I could do that too with NordVPN. So many benefits to gain. And as I say, just the price of a cup of coffee per month. If you sign up via the link in the description, nordvpn.com forward slash Chronicles AFC, you get a huge discount as well as four months for free on the end of your plan. I promise you it is well worth it. And we thank them for their support. Okay, let's talk UEFA Champions League coming to you uh, the day after that absolute cracker between Real Madrid and Manchester City in the first leg of their Champions League semi-final. And just watching that, watching the Champions League for a number of years now without Arsenal participating in it has left me feeling envious, jealous, because when you get to the business end of the Champions League, there is literally nothing better. The standard of football is elite. The atmospheres are incredible. The occasions are unbelievable. What's at stake is huge. The biggest prize in club football, as far as I'm concerned. And as I say, when I sit and I watch other English teams go really far and deep in the competition, it does leave me jealous. It does leave me envious. Because even when we were in the competition, the back end of our participation in the competition prior to us falling out of the top four and and having been away ever since, We weren't very competitive, but I now believe that we have a team that can compete in this competition. That is a match for most of the teams in Europe and can go far. And for me, I've always said as an Arsenal fan growing up, the ultimate glory for me would be to win the Champions League. I've seen Arsenal win the Premier League. I've seen Arsenal win it as invincibles. I've seen Arsenal win domestic doubles. I've seen all of that stuff. What I'm missing from my personal collection of memories and from my memory bank is Arsenal winning the UEFA Champions League. And so I'm desperate to see that. I really, really am. And um, yeah, just sort of watching the game last night, I was kind of looking at the level of the two sides. I know Real Madrid haven't had a great campaign domestically, but my word, they're able to turn it on, aren't they, when it comes uh, to the big time in Europe. Um, Some of the individual performances, Vinicius Jr., every time I watch him, I think he's better and better. Like, I think he's getting better and better to a level where he's got to be up there in the conversation as for the top three best players in the world at the moment. Karim Benzema, majestic up front. We were linked with him so many times back in the day. I can't believe we never got that deal done. Um, Kevin De Bruyne turning up with with a moment of brilliance to get Manchester City back in the game. Listen, Manchester City, for me, I thought in the first half, 
um, perform really well. I thought they took real good control of the game. They suffocated Real Madrid. Real Madrid weren't able to get out. One of the rare occasions where they did venture forward and were able to break through the City press and the lines, they they obviously scored the goal. Sublime finish from Vinicius Jr. That wasn't even a chance. So you can't really knock City for that. One of the providers, one of the, the key players in the build-up to that goal, Camavinga, who's been linked with Arsenal in the past, we're never going to get him because he's just fucking superb. And Real Madrid are certainly going to want crazy money for him. But he's playing that left-back at the moment due to injuries, due to suspensions. And he's doing a marvellous job there. And that just goes to show you what a real sort of intelligent player he is, what a versatile player he is. And, and, and these are the types of things that Mikel Arteta looks for. So you can understand why if there was genuinely an interest in Eduardo Camavinga um, from Arsenal, why he would seem like a good fit. But look, it's nicely poised for the second leg. Really, really looking uh, forward to that. I thought City were a little bit fortunate in the second half not to have conceded another. I thought Real Madrid were much better. They took the game to Manchester City after the break and, and sort of really probably should have scored another goal. They didn't manage to do that. But despite how good City are at home, despite what their Premier League form looks like, Real Madrid are not to be written off. They are European royalty. And I really can't wait to see how the second leg goes. On top of that, you've got the Derby della Madonnina tonight between Milan and Inter. Uh, the other semi-final, first leg between these two fierce rivals in Italian football. Big win for Serie A, this. Whatever happens, whoever goes through and whatever happens to that team in the final, this is a big win for Serie A, which has been out in the cold for a little while. But you've got two teams in the Champions League semi-final. You've got two teams in the Europa League semi-finals. You've got one team in the Europa Conference League semi-finals. And so when you look at that, you know, that just shows you that the standard of Italian football is, is on the rise again. It's not Premier League level yet. Certainly doesn't have the money that the Premier League does. What I would say this probably tells us more than anything is that standard of coaches in Italy is incredibly high and that they're able, even with less resources and lesser players, if you like, to make their teams competitive again on the continental stage. So that is... um. Really, really impressive. And, and as a big Italian football lover, that's something, of course, uh, I'm happy to see. Just a short edition uh, today. I uh, wanted to talk about Aaron Ramsdale. wanted to share my thoughts on the Romeo Lavia stuff because that is not going away. Uh, touch on the Champions League just briefly. I'm in the office today, as you can see, based on where I am. I'm sitting in one of those little meeting booths. I feel like I'm in prison, so I need to get out of here sooner rather than later. But anyway, um, we'll be back tomorrow with a full-length episode again. Um, we'll be taking loads more of your questions. We'll begin our build-up to the big game against Brighton at the weekend as well. And um, I'll see you all very, very soon. Until then, take care of yourselves. Uh, enjoy the sunshine if you've got some. There's a bit here in London. Probably going to rain though, as soon as I walk out the door. I'll catch you all soon. Enjoy the football tonight. And um, tomorrow we focus our minds on Brighton. All the best. Goodbye. I'm Martin Tyler. And you're listening to Harry Simeon.